December 8, 2019, Wuhan. In the Chinese province Hubei, a man is diagnosed with a coronavirus currently unknown to man. Two weeks and a dozen or so known cases later, an algorithm flags this new virus and its characteristics as highly similar to the SARS virus that swept across South Asia about 15 years or so ago. Chinese authorities responded by enacting the so-called containment protocol, putting drastic measures in place to isolate citizens in Wuhan from each other and working closely with national and international authorities to track down any potential carriers of this virus. These are obviously invasive measures taken by a government not exactly known for um, regard or even empathy for their people. But those hard-learned lessons and the data to back it up was crucial to get buy-in from the international community. And as a result, the virus was effectively eradicated by mid-January 2020. Now, this obviously did not happen. Could it have happened? Maybe. But only if you have the necessary data, if you can trust your data, and if you can turn this data into um, actionable information. Good morning, everybody. My name is Edward. I am the Director of Technology at Jade. And over the next 20 minutes or so, I will share with you a few strategies to take your data game to the next level. COVID-19 is a pandemic that at the minimum is severely impacting a large part of the population this year. And at the other end of the spectrum, it has the potential to completely change society as we know it. Luckily, the lack of available information despite a trove of data usually doesn't have the same consequences. But it does have consequences. What we're witnessing in real time playing out on a world stage right now often happens at a different scale in our organizations, and quite frequently. Over the past 10 years or so, we have been hearing the promise of data or even big data. It was a bit like a gold rush. Harness the power of data, unlock incredible insights, and use them to find opportunities, mitigate risk, and enrich the customer experience. And it's not that that's not true or even impossible. On the contrary, many of the biggest organizations in the world are based almost exclusively on a vast amount of data and the ability to turn this data into information. Think of Google, Facebook, Amazon, you name it. The reality, however, for most organizations looks more like this. We drown in data, but it's rubbish. And often it feels more like uh, trying to find something, anything remotely useful for like an upcycle project, um, like a needle in a haystack. In my line of work, I meet a lot of people who are thinking about applying AI in the form of machine learning, who want to put their data to use to fuel predominantly predictions and forecasts. And almost unequivocally, we end up at a point where it's about the state of their data or their trust in their data, the truth in their data. They share with me their hopes about how their new CRM system or ERP system or marketing automation system is going to deliver them with a reliable set of data to work with or if they are further down their digital transformation, how that exact same system has failed to deliver this outcome. This is where I would usually ask people in the audience to raise their hands if this sounds familiar, because my data shows me that at least, at least half of the hands go up. So let's just pretend this just happened. The rest of the session I will spend on this simple concept here. What we're looking here is, I mean, you can look at um, your data processing pipeline in many different ways. I'm using a very simple concept here where we have three phases. Generation or collection of data, cleaning, refinement, consolidating of data, and then phase three, actually turning this data into gold, oil, you name it, extracting useful information. 
And my goal for today is to leave you with one maybe new strategy for you, maybe something that is a little bit left field that, um, that can take your game to the next level for each of these phases. So let's start with phase one, generation of data, collecting of data. Now, data comes in many different ways. It comes through your websites, it comes through your apps, it comes through analytic tools, it comes through um, whatever business process you run in your, in your core systems, it comes through customer service. There's a lot of data and quite often it's, it's not fully clean, there, there are huge gaps, especially if you just started. What can you do to generate data that you can actually work with straight away? So here's the pro data hack tip number one. Generate new data. Look in places that you haven't maybe considered. So what do you see here on, on the screen are a couple of options that you have, and they're not the only ones, right? IoT is a classic field, but it is, um, depending on the industry, applicable or not, uh, whether you want to deploy a whole lot of sensors that feed your data. On the left-hand side, we are in a very traditional uh, financial service environment. Um, in this particular case, it's an insurance. And, and what they have done is they've started mining unstructured data, Word documents, PDFs. And what they uncovered was that they could make that whole um, application process to buy a new policy for um, maybe slightly more complex products. I think we're talking about a, a contamination insurance here. It's not the sort of you know, over-the-counter type thing, um, like a house insurance, for example. And what they allow people to do is to submit their existing policy as a PDF, even um, just by taking pictures with their phone, sending it through, and then generating data or extracting the data out of unstructured information. Um, the technical term around this is, is um, text analytics, basically, or, or um, text mining, where you use various machine learning technologies and um, statistical uh, methodologies to, to extract it. But the good news is, a lot of this complexity is now hidden. There are systems out there and, and, and companies that, that sell this stuff at a per usage base. So you can just go and start mining this tomorrow, sign up, upload a couple of documents, just play around with a couple of config settings and create your own data that is complete because you have full control over it. And that is enriching what you currently have. If we then move a, a little bit more to the right on this picture, um, on the top, uh, both of these are computer vision sourced data streams. On the top, and it's a little bit hard to see probably over the distance, you, you see um, a parking lane outside the Christchurch Hospital. And the CCTV camera that's been there for 10 years or so, being used to locate free car, car parking spaces to help people find car parks around the hospital faster. This is information that is currently not available, but the data stream was always there. It didn't take very long to move from a visual representation to actually currently there are no car parks or currently there are two car parks on the right hand side. And then retail um, here in Christchurch has em uh, employed us to do a, a, um, a people movement system where not only are we counting how many people go into this new retail development and therefore feeding into everything from um, commercial models as in, you know, what is the lease in this, in this um, new development for each individual retailer. It's also feeding into our communities. Um, we see one small screen here, but it's actually around how people move around the city. And that informs everything from infrastructure decisions as simple as should we put a park bench there to how we manage and how we control our traffic. Again, this is data that didn't exist before. But people start you looking in maybe slightly unusual places and they discover data that they have control over that they can mine straight away. And if you look at this, this was spun up in two weeks. That's all it took. It's a pretty simple data set 
It has a timestamp, it has location information, and it tells us if it's a person or a table or a car or a bicycle, and that's it. Very easy to analyze. Now, when you do go down that path and generate new data, one thing that I would like you to keep in mind is that you will also have to think about different ways how to process and store this data. Right? So, for example, this, um, the text mining that generates data at the same level that we used before and it's storing it in the same level as we used to do. It, it basically goes into a relational database. However, with IoT or computer vision extracted data, we're talking about a lot of data here. Um, one of these cameras, if they run 24-7, they produce about a million records each day for a single camera. So you can see how that scales very quickly into many, many million records and then rinse repeat month after month. And so you really have to start thinking about a relational database, a SQL Server, an Oracle, and MySQL is just not going to cut it anymore. Right? Um, it, it's going to get too expensive, you can't analyze it, but it's so simple. Yeah? This is where the cloud comes in and the, the vast range of different storage options that you have. So if you are going down that path, it's, it's not that hard, but there are a couple of things that you should keep in mind and that you should have your IT team being across. Okay, good. So that's strategy number one. If you don't like what you have, find new data, drill somewhere else. Strategy number two, decentralize your data. If you think about the trends that have happened over the last five to 10 years, SaaS is a classic example of software as a service where platforms have emerged where you no longer have that single central ERP system often that is your one source of truth that knows about absolutely everything. You, you don't have bespoke systems to the same extent anymore that again manage and monitor all of your data. What you end up having is you have islands. You've got a system that looks after your CRM, your customer relationship management, and maybe has your customer services included in there. You, you might have a completely different system for finance or billing or inventory management and, and, and. And uh, part of the reason why applications like Salesforce and CRM have become so popular is because people now try to do the same thing that we did 20 years ago by adding all of these modules on top of the same system. Now, sometimes this works. But quite often, actually, it doesn't work because the systems have been built to do one thing really well. And uh, yes, they are extensible and configurable, but they are typically not built for every single thing that you need to do. So what you then often end up having is you, you start having these data silos. And if you're trying to figure out if you have this problem, just ask yourself, is there an increase of integration projects? or can you not use a lot of the built-in functionality of your SaaS platform because you're lacking data? A very simple example around that problem is um, having, a, say, a CRM system and uh, uh, a dispatch system. The CRM system will have your address information about your clients. That's what it does. That's what it's um, there for. Your dispatch system needs that information. So if you don't have that information also physically stored in that system, in most cases, at the very minimum, you don't get your reports out of it. You don't see how you can optimize your business. You definitely can't see how you mitigate risk in your business. Uh, and so if you then go with a point-to-point -point integration, quite often what you have is you end up with two copies of the same data, and quite often you get the problem of which one do I trust? <clears throat> Decentralizing data is a little bit like going to a running sushi restaurant, except we all have the chance to grab exactly the same thing. Now, I do realize how, <clears throat> excuse me, an analogy like this is a little bit of a problem in times like these, but in my defense, I've used this analogy for many, many years now. 
The idea really is, instead of sending data from one system to the other, you put it on a, on a travelator, on something that goes round and round in circles, and other systems can say, do I like the data or not? Am I interested in your address information? Am I interested in your tax information? Am I interested in product information? And what it does is it decouples the risk from each other. In technical terms, we talk about a pub-sub pattern, a publish and subscribe, a single publisher, many people subscribe, a little bit like a blog post or, or any sort of media um, communication. Um, the cool thing about that is that you can um, run these integration projects, if you want to call them like this, in, um, in parallel. Because as a listener, in the technical term, as somebody who takes data off that travelator, you are completely isolated from the rest of the systems. So you can develop, test, and all that sort of stuff without impacting anything else. And that means you can, instead of doing big bang projects, can take on one tiny thing at a time and you can experiment, just like in the running sushi where you say, hmm, don't know what that is, but what happens if I eat it? And sometimes you like it, and sometimes you don't. Now, sometimes this happens already, and a lot of people that are playing around with systems like MuleSoft are intending to go there. What I really encourage you to do that is to do this with conviction, because that's not the sort of stuff that you do half-hearted. You have to sit down, you have to define which system is the master for each set of data, and then you can just put it out there and say, everybody else, here it is. Yeah? And if you look at this in the context that we talked about earlier, about the Chinese authorities, um, I mean, you can, you can feel about it any way you want, but that data flow was not accessible. Right or wrong, people thought it's of nobody else's business, and we keep the data to us. If there would have been a running sushi, pub sub style data flow, other people would have maybe tested it and would have come to a conclusion earlier and we would have been able to con um, contain COVID-19 earlier. Right, sorry. So lastly, um, Pro hack number three, narrate your data. If you look at the pipeline where we extract information out of um, your given data set, in most cases we talk about visualization, dashboards, charts, drill downs, you name it. Excel, of course. Um, that's all true and it's all really important. You cannot stress how important visualization is because extracting knowledge is really about feeding into decisions and if the people that make these decisions or that have influence on these decisions do not understand the tables and data streams that they look at. How are they gonna make reasonable decisions? This is why with COVID-19 now you suddenly see all these charts about the flattening curve and the P curve and all that sort of stuff coming out. Because it's the only way we all can understand and can relate to it. Oh, with that peak we're gonna expand our or, or extend our health system. Now it makes sense without it. It's just a story, I don't know. Narrating your data is a slightly different angle to it. The example that I brought here with me today is something that we did probably 18 months ago. I've been talking about this occasionally on conferences. On the left hand side, you see a typical life insurance comparison. Somebody entered what they're after uh, on one of these comparison sites. In this case, I believe it was Life Broker over in um, Australia. And it comes back with a vast in, um, amount of data. It gives me the various companies with their products and then it has all the different features and exclusions and inclusions and special things around that specific, specific product. Now, if I look at this, I feel quite overwhelmed because I'm not a life insurance expert. It's really difficult to turn this data into information, into explaining to me which one I should use. This is where data narration, often also called NLG, natural language generation, comes in. Where there are tools out there that you can plug into your, your Tableau, your, your Power BI, your QuickSight, whichever one you use, that help you 
turn data like this or even charts into something like an executive summary. So what we've done here in this example is we've taken the best or what is defined as the best or cheapest offer and say this matches what you asked for and it's the lowest premium. Here's one that is the most comprehensive one and here's a good compromise in the middle where um, uh, it has add-ons that you can choose to make it fit your bill. And now suddenly, in three sentences, my attention is directed to the things that I should look into more closely. This is what an executive summary does. This is really, really useful in things like financial reports, trend analysis, and so forth, right? Because it's the thing that connects with the people that pay for it and that pay for it if they make the wrong decisions as well. Right, um, this is really all I had for you today. Three quick tips that you can look into that you could get up and running if you wanted to in weeks rather than months or years. Find new data, look in unusual places, Make sure that data circulates well. Don't keep it siloed off just because nobody else needs it. Find your sushi train, and there are many solutions out there, to put it out there and experiment with data coming through. And lastly, don't just think about pure visualization. Think about things like data narration. Think about turning it into this one or two paragraphs that draws people and people's attention to the one thing that you really want to get across. And with that, I'll leave you to it. I really hope that on an organizational level, while we don't have the impact that we currently see in the world, we are starting to make more use of the data that we have and to, to limit the risk to us and our people and also to enrich our um, experience towards the customers.